war is gone, in the ranks of death you'll find him. His father's sword he hath girded on, and his wild harps long behind him. Hello and welcome to another Irish military seminar. As always, I would like to acknowledge our hosts, Riverbank Art Centre, June Fest, and of course, Kildare Library Services and the County Kildare Decade of Commemorations Committee of Kildare County Council. I have the honour of welcoming an old friend back to the seminar, Sergeant Wayne Fitzgerald, who appeared on this very stage in 2019 in front of a completely full house as part of our programme on the Battles of Jadaville and Atiri. Sergeant Wayne Fitzgerald joined the Defence Forces in 1990, serving initially with the 5th Infantry Battalion and the 2nd Brigade Headquarters. During his 31-year career, he has worked in a number of roles within the Army and the Air Corps. In 2011, he was detached to Defence Forces HQ to work on Military.ie and in May of 2011, he was appointed Editor of Uncustentor, or The Defender, The Defence Forces magazine down until May of 2020. Wayne has served overseas as a peacekeeper with the UN, the EU and NATO. In Lebanon in 1991, Kosovo in 2002 and 2010, and Bosnia in 2008. Wayne, you're very welcome. And very may I take time just to say thank you and thanks to all at the Department of Defence, the Kura Command, the Kura Military Museum, and on Custantor and various veteran groups who've helped us over the years with the Irish Military Seminar. But of course, Wayne, you're living in Kildare. Yeah. Whereabouts? Kildare Town. All right. And how did you end up there? Because you have a bit of a Dublin accent now, if I'm not mistaken. Thanks very much. Um, yeah, I, was, um, I bought a house down here in 2004 off the plans that wasn't going to be built until 2005. So what a good year lead into that, you know. Okay. So we Took you a bit of time to acclimatise to it, <laughs> did, is that? Yeah. And then you ended up with Defence Force Headquarters, which of course is based in Newbridge anyway, isn't it? It, it is, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So you're yeah. becoming a bit of a local now. I am, yeah. 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 Okay. I'm, well, I'm, I'm fully integrated into the, into the community now. Well, just one more personal question. Mm. You transferred from infantry to the Air Corps. I mean, how does that come about? It, it's very common now, but I mean, back then um, in 2004, 2005, I'd done 15 years in the infantry, and as I said, I'd bought the house in Kildare, so I was commuting from uh, Kildare Town to Ratmonians. Uh, so this would have been pre-N7 upgrade, where you know we'd, we'd lights at Kill and Johnstown and, and stuff like that. So it, it, it made this, I, I wasn't too familiar with the Curragh camp uh, for work, work-wise. Okay. I'd been there on courses, but, but to find an actual job in the Curragh camp, so I, I decided I'd look for, uh, and I was qu the qualifications that I held in the, in the Army were transferable to the Air Corps. Uh, so that's why I went back to the exact same role that I was doing in the Army into the Air Corps, okay. who had okay. a vacancy at the time. So there was an opportunity. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, we're here to discuss Shadow Warriors, um, your book on the Irish Army Ranger Wing. But I mean, t how, how does a book like this come about? I mean, where do you get uh, a, an idea for a book on the Army Ranger Wing? Um, initially, the book came from my co-author, uh, Paul O'Brien, who was um, working with me. He was a contributor, a regular contributor to On Cousin Tour, and Paul himself had written uh, numerous books on, on 1916, the Curra Mutiny. So he was well versed in, in, in the, the, the Irish Defence Forces and so forth. Um, and we'd worked on a, a, a Ranger Wing special issue back in 2017, which took a lot of planning, a uh, lot of articles pulled, day before we were going to print due to... Uh, that was with Uncustentor. With Uncustentor, yeah. Uh, due to operational uh, um, procedures. So uh, Paul had said to me there, I'm working on that magazine, that wouldn't it be great now if we could produce this on a larger scale okay. and, and cover the 40 years of the Army Ranger Wing. And of course, this is the 40th anniversary yeah, as yeah. well. March so this year would have been... Okay. The, Right. Well, I mean, are you still in on Cusantor? No, I've moved. I went back after 10 years of being the editor, or working in PR branch, and nine years as the editor on Cusantor, and the book being, uh, you know, the pinnacle of, of that career, uh, and reaching 31 years, I decided uh, the magazine was going digital, from print to digital, so I, presume, I, I just took that opportunity of the magazine changing over to allow a new editor to come in and take the magazine on in a different direction, okay. as I did in 2011 when I took over. 
But you're yeah. still in public relations? I'm working relations. now in public relations in the Air Corps, yeah. Okay, yeah. and where are you based? Uh, Baldon. Okay. Yeah. So you came across the Army Ranger Wing, obviously through all, all your years of experience and whatever. You've written about it in on Cusentor yeah. um, in 2017. Then we have Shadow Warriors from Mercier Press. I mean, how does this... Is there a market? Was there a need for this book? Um, in, the, in the nine years I worked in PR branch and, and as editor on Custom Tour, any issue that we ever put out with a, with a Ranger Wing on the front cover or the word Ranger Wing was our best-selling issues <laughs> of that year. So it was a no-brainer that Ranger Wing, uh, that type of Special Forces content... That there was interest in it. It sells, yeah, it sells. Okay, look, tell us a bit about the, the Irish Army Ranger Wing. Um, operationally, like they would have, like all special forces, they all came about through um, in actions within on Ireland in in their countries. So in Ireland, we had the troubles from the, from the 60s to 70s, right up into the mid 90s. In effect, it was to deal with terrorism. It was to deal with terrorism. Okay. Yeah. So most soldiers uh, want to be the best. So at the time, we were running Ranger courses, uh, which is uh, com you know. Not, not sort of conventional warfare, but other, other warfare. Um, so them guys would have done their courses with the Rangers. There was no unit at the time. Okay, so they do the course, but they go back yes, to... Yes, and they okay. wore a Ranger tab, you know what I mean? Um, and then when the troubles started hitting in the uh, late 70s and early 90s, uh, the government saw, the Defence Forces saw permission of the government to actually form these troops into a unit that could be called on within notice. So okay, so when, if it's 40 years, that's... So, March, 19 March 1980. Okay. Uh, the, now, there was a good, good lead-up into that. So, you're talking 78, right up, you know, they would have been formed. Uh, they would have been getting all the stuff Everything together. Everything takes yeah, people time, doing training. It, yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, yeah. the, the term then, and I mean, my Irish pronunciation, I'll, I, I'll ask forgiveness from people, but Ski and Fianna O'Glock. I yeah. mean, that brings us back to a different time again, and not so far from us here. We have the Hill of Allen. That yeah. brings us back to Nafina. Yeah, yeah. So the word Fenolok, uh, there's no uh, initial uh, translation of that into English. So they use the designate Ranger, the word Ranger. Uh, but guys will wear a Fenolok flash uh, on their arm. Uh, it's, it's very similar to the actual American US Ranger badge because the initial troops that were trained to be Ranger Wing, the initial officers and the initial people, actually went over to America and trained with the US Rangers. And there's a fascinating... So there's a connection there. But there was a fascinating claim in the book as well that the American Rangers actually began life on the island of Ireland. Yes. Uh, in Antrim, yeah. I think, yeah. In, yeah. in World War II. Yeah, which yeah. Is coming to the end of World War II. Yeah, yeah. so we're kind of coming back. Yeah. It's and, and also with the FINA, I think the motto... It, now again, the Irish being Glana or Gree, Nyart or Nyeg, August Bart, the rare or Mreher, the cleanliness of our hearts, the strength of our limbs, and our commitment to our promise. That was an old Fianna poem. Yeah, yeah. But you told me just when we were meeting up beforehand, you told me that the badges are still handed out. Yeah, so um, to, to tie it all in and to keep um, esprit de corps within the unit, they would sometimes use the Hill of Allen uh, for the operatives that have gone through all this hard training and when they're presenting them with their badges or maybe their, uh, th they would get the badge forced and then their Green Beret, they would sometimes use the Hill of Allen as a scene where the lads would go up the hill and then receive their, their, their berets. And in, of course, and all those good Kildare men know that yeah. the Hill of Allen was the home of the FINA and yeah. Fionn McCool and the FINA. Yeah. Yeah. So look, I mean, the Army Ranger, what does the Army Ranger wing do? Um, if I can break it down for you into two different roles, um, you would have conventional warfare where they would be doing stuff behind enemy lines. So long range patrols, um, ambushes, uh, raids, all that type of stuff that where normal soldiers are this side of the enemy line, fight, I, I, you know, in, in contact with the enemy, whereas Ranger Wing Special Forces operatives would go beyond that and do stuff you know, in small teams, they could be lying out there for days observing the enemy coming back and passing back intel. And then the, the other side of that role, um, it used to be described as the black role and the green role, so the green role being the, the, the conventional warfare and the black role being counter-terrorism. We uh, know as black ops, I yeah, suppose. Black yeah, black ops, yeah. yeah. So uh, them terminologies aren't used as much now. It's conventional uh, warfare and... and um, um, 
aid to civil power, so where they're given uh, specialist aid to the government, mostly the uh, Angarda Shia Khanna. Uh, they would be anti-terrorism, uh, anti-hostage. Um, but I think you make it very clear, don't you? I mean, aid to civil power. Yeah. They have to be asked. They have to be asked. Yeah. They have to be asked. Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. And they're and they're operationally ready to be deployed. Uh, you know, anywhere in the country. That's the great thing about being located within the Curragh. They're central to the country. You know, and and you know, within a short time, can be airlifted to any part of the and country. And their first actual deployment wasn't that that was I in support to the Gardaí, yeah. um, uh, the Don Tidy, Don Tidy yeah, yeah, yeah. kidnapping. I think they came in at the end of that a whole operation that there would have been normal troops on the ground forced, but yeah, it gave them their force, boy, I think. And I suppose but it defines a role for them yes, within yeah. the island of Ireland as yeah, well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but they're, I mean, they're a covert organisation. They don't really court the limelight as such. So does, does that make it difficult to research or write a book? Um, I mean, did you spend time with the, the, the current Ranger Wing? We did. Uh, thankfully to the to DCOS Operations General, uh, Kieran and Brennan at the time, Major General or, uh, Kieran Brennan, um, he gave us permission. And once he got permission from, he's the operational control he had at the time of, of, uh, uh, of the Ranger Wing. Uh, once word comes down, um, they get they open their doors to let myself and Paul in. So we got in to uh, interview current members. We got interview past members. We got to watch these guys operating in their training, in their uh, uh, procedures. You know, I mean, uh, as I explained to you uh, earlier, you know, we watched them parachuting in. We watched them uh, assaulting buildings. We watched them assaulting cars carrying out our different procedures. We got to ask them then. Just that story about the parachuting in. I yeah. mean, you, you, there was a particular incident. It was a Baldonnel with, with yeah, Ryan the, Cowan was the yeah, t-shirt at the time. for the UN 50th anniversary, uh, they parachuted in with uh, holding the tricolour and landed and, and walked within feet of, of handing over. But four men yeah. parachuting in, yeah. holding a tricolour and yeah. then landing with such precision yeah. and to walk straight up with that flag and present yeah. it to the Taoiseach. I mean, yeah. that's yeah. the stuff of legends yeah. really, isn't yeah. it? Yeah, yeah. I have to say their skills are second to none. And was there any difficulties like in, in, in terms of getting access to personnel files or being able to, you know, deal with sensitive information? Um, the way the Ranger Wing is broken down, it's broken down into teams and specialists. So, I mean, when we were coming to different chapters of the book, you know, the Ranger Wing would select a person to, for us to talk to on particular topics. So that gave us current, up-to-date procedures of what these guys were doing. And it wasn't, you know, former members telling us, you know, well, when I, when I was there, I did this. That was a great thing to have, you know, uh, and obviously their identities were all protected. Um, but it meant then we, when we had all the different chapters laid out, we could go back to the Ranger Wing with the, with the final product. And you had instructors' manuals over the yeah. years yeah. And, and, and so yeah. on. But I mean, you said their identities. Is that still today? I mean, nobody knows technically no. who these guys are. Still to this day, uh, their identities are protected. Uh, even within the defence forces, so even within within training courses, if they're mixing with other 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 ranks and all that, you know, you, their f their faces are blurred out internally. Never mind in the public uh, domain. You know and what I mean? is this twofold? This is a kind of protection for them and their families, but also, I suppose, uh, the, the the strength of of, of their, their their ability lies in, yeah. in the fact that nobody really yeah. knows who they yeah. are. Yeah, yeah. Okay. It just protects them. Yeah. Um, I had to, yeah, it's, it's kind of frustrating in that because in that, that, you want to know more well, as a yeah. reader. You're yeah. kind of down at one stage, you're down in the jungles with these guys and you're trying to figure it out. And yet y you can't kind of discover too much about what happens yeah. for obvious reasons. But I mean, why are we as readers, why are, why are we drawn to this unit? I mean, is it the mystique? Uh, is it that these are the kind of men that, you know, do things that other people aspire to? push themselves to the limit to excel. What is it, do you think, yeah, that it's definitely makes this interesting? It's definitely the mystique, I think. Um, I mean, most soldiers will get to do an awful lot of things in their careers, uh, but it might be, you know, once, twice, three times a year when they go on exercise or they're doing operation operational uh, training or, you know, uh, operations. But these guys are practicing every day you know, every day of the week, every day, every week of the year. Uh, they're going places and doing stuff. You know, they're jumping out of helicopters, they're roping out of helicopters, they're going out and assaulting, um, 
you know, passenger passenger ferries, you know, just to keep practice. They're going on boats, ribs, straight out, you know. And I suppose there, there's a reality to this that you're you're preparing to neutralise. Yes. Uh, let's use the, the, the vocabulary, but a potential threat. Yeah. So you're not just doing this to keep yourself. No, they're occupied. training for the day that they're called on that they would have a wide variety of uh, exercise experience and operational yeah. experience that if the time is called on, they can go and do it. And you can't train for this and then stop. You know, I yeah. mean, it, it's a continuous current. thing. Yeah. You, must you have current. to be yeah. up, up to speed. Yeah. Um, okay, so I mean, what are the, the kind of key skills uh, required for an individual then to, to make the grade, to, to become a ranger? Um, the ranger wing selection now has changed over the last few years. Um, the physical fitness will only get you so far. So, you know, they, will, they can only draw from within the Defence Forces, from the ranks within the Defence Forces. Um, both male and female can go for it. Um, Army, Air Corps, Navy, they'll take anyone from whether you're infantry, communications, uh, medics, they'll take anyone that can come in with skills and learn. The training now has been made modularized, so that if a, if a, if a candidate goes down and starts on, on module wo one, uh, which is the physical part, the force part of getting in, getting shouted at, crawling in through dirt and, you know, up to your neck and then getting little sleep back out this again. This is kind of national health, or uh, what do you call it? The, the, uh, the, the very the similar to RTE's Ultimate Hell yeah, Week, Hell week yeah, program. Yeah. yeah, that would give you a clear and insight into, into, you know, what the initial candidates will face when, it, when, they, when they arrive uh, down to the Ranger Wing. Um, but mental fitness is a big aspect of getting through that, that training. Um, you must be prepared, like, you have to train for uh, convoyance bases, you have to train to be, you know, lying still for hours, you have to be tra trained to carry your, your gear, you know, in, an, in ultimate endurance uh, training uh, regimes. But you're skilled as well, I mean, to use the, your yeah. word, I mean, operative, I mean, these yes. are skilled operatives. There's navigation, there's arms, there's, you know, sniping, yeah. Yeah. you know, are, uh, and it's air, parachuting, sea. diving, yeah. yeah. So there's, so the, the, where that where that aspect of the training comes in is, in the modules up to module three, you will get your phenolock badge, and that's where you know if, if you break a leg or anything like that, you're you, and you've passed module three, you're allowed to come back then and start on the next round of training on module four because you've passed module one, two, and three. That, that facility wasn't there years ago. So guys went down once, failed on, uh, you know, after a week or two, or failed after four weeks, and they went down a second time. You know, they're probably not going to go down a third or fourth time, but with the modular training, you know, they can get more people through it and still maintain the, qu the quality of the soldier or the operative at the end. Is it fair to say that there'll always be people within, say, the, the unit or whatever that will excel? You know, someone will be the best sniper within the yes. unit and someone, yeah. but really they, 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 they have to learn everything. Yeah, they have to learn Because everything. Yeah. the yeah. chances are that yeah. you could end up as a one or two person team. Yeah. You know, I mean, there's, there's no fear that it's always going to be the entire wing yeah. which is deployed. So when they get to module four and five is where they start practicing their uh, other skills, parachuting, uh, you know, amphibious assault and diving. Um, and then when they've learned all those skills, and same with medical skills as well, but one person in that team could end up going on to be a paramedic and he would be the, uh, the, the designated medic within that team. But everyone else would have to have medical skills. Okay. You know what I mean? So that's the and the same with communications. One person might go off and be the communication specialist, but everyone else would still have to learn communications. Because y at some stage you rely yeah. On, yeah. on every every yeah. person. If someone that is team, taken out, the other person has to has, has to be has able to, to do it. I mean, there's great pride in the book, right through from the first page. I mean, uh, but I mean, there's great belief, and and it's it, it's it's comes across, I mean, you're kind of brought joyously along. I mean, are they this good? I mean, uh, you know, we talk about, like, uh, from the movies, we know Delta Force and Navy SEALs, Spetsnats, and you have the French and the Germans, all these special forces. But, I mean, is the Irish Army Ranger Wing up there with the best of them? We believe so. Uh, we wrote the book, and, and, and everything that we've read and, and researched led us to believe that they're up there. Um, they've trained and operated with most of the special forces uh, 
at least in Europe. They've been overseas with, with uh, the Americans. Um, they've won American sniper competitions on a few occasions in the last few years. Which is amazing. To which go is amazing to go up against their territory. You know, yeah, yeah. And, and, and to win. And, and be competing against Delta Force and, and yeah. you know. Um, so, yeah, I believe, uh, you know, they're at, the, they're at the top of their game there. But also um, operationally. I mean, they've been deployed as a unit, uh, you know, on a numerous occasions. Um, they've been to uh, Liberia, uh, uh, Eritrea, um, Somalia. I mean, Somalia alone, uh, they landed in Somalia September uh, 93. Uh, and then if you can remember Black Hawk Down, the movie uh, in Mogadishu, where, you know, uh, the American US Rangers who were operating independently from the UN at the time, uh, lost 18 Rangers in that incident. Uh, and we, as you mentioned earlier on the Mogadishu run, we had a Ranger unit there, you know, bringing, in, bringing stuff in, in and out, you know, food and supplies who were uh, constantly attacked, you know what I mean? But that was it, in the, in, in the lead up when we were sitting down, we talked about this Mog run, this run to Mogadishu, uh, 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 and they were involved in a particular firefight where yeah. 10 insurgents were killed. Yeah. This isn't just paperwork, yeah. it's not yeah. just yeah. a story about, you know, yeah. the formation uh, 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 and the management of the unit. These guys were out there, as you say, yeah. Somalia, yeah. at the time of Black Hawk Down, it could easily have been our Irish. guys involved. Yeah, this is the job, been, yeah. isn't it? Yeah, yeah. This is the job, yeah. And there was uh, another marvelous. I think uh, what was it? Liberia, where they rescued something like thirty-five civilians from the containers. Who'd been imprisoned in a yeah. forty-foot container. Yeah, yeah. You know, I mean, yeah, th like just the, a real deal. They're, they're, like we would have loved to have developed and delved down deeply into that, in, into those incidents more. But uh, obviously, trying to protect, you know, uh, non-disclosures and, and give too much away of what the range, how, how the range ring operates on the ground. But that incident alone, uh, you know, interviewing the guys, or listening to the guys, uh, saying how they, you know, they came out of the bush, you know, had a Mexican standoff with other um, armed... In Chad, something like uh, 200. Armed elements, you know what I mean? Yeah, and I mean, then, that's unreal. You know, uh, and as you said earlier on to me as well, I mean, uh, your nationality can't be identified you know, just by a, a small tricolour on your on your shoulder, you know what I mean? What was remarkable about that standoff that you talk about is that you have these kind of militia or, or, or regular forces from the Chad side coming out f with a standoff against Irishmen who they don't know who they are, mm. and yet it isn't all about kind of, uh, um, you know, uh, a firefight ensues. What, what happens is that they, both sides talk it down, and when mm. they do realise that they're not part of the um, the, the opposing force and that they're, they're Irish or whatever yeah. it is. Uh, this both yeah. sides kind of are able to yeah. extricate themselves from it. Yeah. So it's not all gung ho. No. And uh, we talked about that marvelous. We are Rangers, mighty mighty Rangers. I think yeah. every kid in the car uh, yeah. around Calera that we used to sing it. It's not all about that kind of portrayal that yeah. we're, we're used to. Yeah. You are trained yeah. to use the, this lethal force as a last resort, yeah. isn't it? Yeah, we have, a, we have degrees of force that we can use. And I think that's, that's um, um, Dag Hammarskjöld, I think, came out with a, a statement. Uh, he was the UN Secretary General at the time of the Congo. Um, soldiers, um, you know, don't do peacekeeping, but they're the only people that can do peacekeeping. Right. You know what I mean? In that... Every soldier trains to kill, he trains to be a soldier, to be operational. But to, to be able to do that, and then, as you said, step it back and bring the peacekeeping aspect in and come out with the hand force instead of the bullets. And to understand what peacekeeping means, it's yes. to go into it and stabilize a region yeah. and to protect human life. Wh yeah. Life that, where you've got civilians who can't, obviously, who are caught up in this maelstrom where you have thousands, hundreds of thousands of refugees, yeah. maybe sometimes. Yeah. So they are on the front line. The stats that you quote, um, f is it Liberia from July? Uh, no, Minusma in Mali. In so, Mali. Uh, Minusma is, is considered by uh, security uh, consultants to be the UN's most dangerous mission. mission. Uh, so in a seven year period, uh, July 2003, to say May 2020, uh, we showed a statistic where um, 216 uh, UN peacekeepers have been killed uh, by um, insurgents. We don't seem to hear that. No. I mean, uh, and then even the statistic of 360 plus injured. Yeah. 
So, you know, you take the, the 216 plus the 360, and yeah. then most recently then uh, we had um, three uh, Ranger Wing operatives injured in a roadside incident where uh, an IED, an improvised explosive device, went off under their armoured vehicle, uh, and they were injured. Um, they're back, thankfully, safely now, uh, and still uh, working and operational. But yeah, so only through the, the protection of that vehicle, vehicles are now designed mm -hmm. with a V-shaped bottom that the blast will, will disperse and won't go up into the vehicle. You know, the vehicle might still blow out a wheel or might still be, but, but you know, they can still be operational and get them out of the, uh, get them out of the incident. But it reminds us, I suppose, yeah, of how close, work yeah, and how, how close we how are to the front line. Is, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, we've peacekeepers there, I think, it's over 60 years now, isn't it? 62 years now. We've, yeah. uh, we've, the, we've, we've the UN's uh, record of uh, 62 years of unbroken service. And I think you quoted a figure of something like 70,000 individual Individual missions, yeah. yeah, That's yeah, unreal. Yeah, yeah. It's, a, it's, yeah. it's a crazy statistic. And it's a great pride. Yeah, and it should be. It should be, uh, you know, shouted from the top. And to put this into perspective, I suppose, sometimes the first guys to go out there are and the, the Rangers. Rangers. Yeah. Because yeah. they have to take the yeah. you see the lie of the land, and, yeah. so and it's on. great for um, it's great for um, operational troops that when they deploy to know that they have a ranger wing unit ahead of them, yeah. or they have a ranger wing unit that have gone, been done the first tour of duty there, and have established a firm base. So there's a confidence. Yes, there. Yeah. but it, something that we wouldn't necessarily hear about as well. Tell me a bit about hearts and minds. Uh, of operating overseas yeah, just, and stuff yeah, like that. Yeah, because, yeah. I mean, it's not a phrase that we would be used to. Yeah, well, I think in that 62 years, I think Irish troops... Uh, I mean, I think the pinnacle of hearts and minds for me would be where the Irish were asked back into Lebanon, back into Tibni, and the mayor of Tin, uh, Tibni personally came to Ireland to ask Ireland would they re-contribute. So if you can imagine, we were there from 78 to 2008, I think it was. And then for a number of years, you know, there was no Irish, uh, there were still Irish elements in, in Lebanon, but no actual physical troops. And for that mayor, you know, who grew up probably as a child, uh, growing up with Irish peacekeepers uh, operating in Lebanon, uh, to see, you know, and the, and the, the joy, and I remember interviewing an, an Irish uh, Lebanese guy, and, you know, and he was telling me the story of his village and how proud he was that Irish troops were going back Mm -hmm. I mean, that was, that, that was emotional. Think, but the point of it is, isn't it, that you're not just there to do the job, you become involved yeah. with yeah. The, the communities. And right through the book, I mean, there's East Timor, there's Liberia, Somalia, all yeah. the most dangerous places in the world. Yeah, even and the Balkans uh, back in the mid... Uh, absolutely. You know, yeah. I mean, I remember being there in Kosovo myself in, in 2002. Um, I mean, we were trained to go into the village without the weapon being held you know, ready, you know, to keep the weapon either sloped or down to the side. And we wore berets, where other troops that were there stationed at the same time were wearing flak jackets, helmets, weapons held at the ready. Um, and when we, when, when an Irish... Instantly provocative. Yeah, when an Irish yeah. patrol would come into the village, people would come out and engage with you. And that, yeah. that's your hearts and minds there. Yeah. Whereas other conventional troops that were, are still on, you know, they're probably, they've, 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 as a nation, they've probably been in wars themselves. And here they are now, still in the war mindset. And mm -hmm. here you have these highly trained special forces, troops mm. behind enemy lines in these local villages, yeah. again, engaging with the yeah. villagers. Yeah. Because this is the, the, the way forward. This is what works, obviously, yeah. you know. Um, but the threats are real. Yeah, the threats I mean, are real. I yeah. mean, the, the work is not done. This isn't, like, it doesn't finish on the last page and say, and so were the army ranger wing. I mean, yeah. there's a need, obviously, still there yeah, for Yeah, it's him. like having an insurance policy. You know, one day, you may have to ring that insurance company and call it in. So that's the great thing about having, you know, a, a ranger wing and a, and a defence forces. Uh, one of the jobs, on call. And one of the jobs they do is kind of close protection. And I yeah. mean, Queen Elizabeth, you mentioned. Yeah. I mean, there, there yeah. was a real danger there, yeah. wasn't there? I yeah. mean, there's a real fear yeah. that something could go wrong. Yeah. Barack Obama, yeah. the G8 summit, which was, was that for Mana, I think it was? Yeah, I think so, we yeah. A, yeah. a role. It was cross, cross um, cooperation, yeah. Yeah, yeah we, we could list them like we had, we had uh, with Joe Biden here, with Trump here. I mean, uh, to have, you know, uh, and, and operatives, like if you're, if you're a trained close protection operative, I mean, you want to be Which at the top of your for, game. For yeah. general terms, you're a bodyguard. Yeah. But yeah. 
There's so much more. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, and you want to be, you know, whether providing cover as a sniper in a helicopter or, you know, uh, running alongside the, 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 the car. You know what I mean? So, I mean, um, but also Irish diplomats going abroad. So when, when, when uh, you know, the Taoiseach or anyone is abroad, you know, and they were going to Mali, say, there would be a ranger wing close protection team uh, provided to them. If we, have a, if we've a, uh, if we hold a, a top UN position, so like we had a general, say, in Lebanon as the force commander, he would have an Irish ranger wing close protection team for the duration of, of his two-year period. So where I'm, if, I'm, if I'm overseas and I see a, a French general and I see French special forces with him, how proud can it be to see an Irish general with an Irish yeah. special forces close protection And team? I suppose as well it testifies to actually just how good these guys are. Yeah. I mean, if they're involved with the internal security teams that would be with the Queen and with Barack Obama and Biden and Trump and so on, yeah. I mean, they, they, they have to be of, of, of yes. you know, great merit and great quality. Um, so I mean, look. I mean, what are the hopes for the book? I mean, I, I mean, what the plan was obviously to get this story out there. Yeah. But I mean, what, was there anything more? I mean, has well, it we done had well? planned. We, we, as I said to you, the book took over two years to to plan, write, get get sign off, and get it out there. And then obviously COVID hit us. But I mean, through the pandemic, uh, it was a great time for some books. I know books bookshops are, are were struggling. But for some reason, Shadow Warriors uh, caught people's imagination. The cover, the, the yeah. story. I mean, as you say, every time you put it on a cushion or a Yeah, work. thankfully uh, to ourselves and Mercia Press, the book has uh, sold 2,500 copies. Wow. Uh, so it's, it's sold out. It's, it's now print on demand. Yeah, so it's still available, I presume, in some bookshops. Yeah. But from the warehouse point of view, the 2,500 copies have, have been sold. And so, I mean, yeah, we're, we're delighted that we, we, we've got the word out. Uh, we'd hope to build on it, maybe with a second book, uh, possibly in a few years' time. But I think it's, it's... I hope that the book is considered as a manual for people, whether they're joining the Defence <laughs> yeah. Forces or they want to be a Ranger Wing. I was going to say that. Yeah. The, the, the pitch is there. Well, like I'm, I'm reading yeah. it and I'm kind of getting, you know, I was, yeah. I was pulling yeah. out the, the equipment out of the wardrobe last night. But I mean, it, it is, the pitch is there, isn't it? Yeah, so I'm hoping I mean, that like the young people of Ireland that, you know, who consider a career in the Defence Forces and, and put the, the Ranger Wing as their, as their goal, because uh, they can only draw from within the branches of the, the, of the Defence Forces. Yeah. Uh, that people will use it as their, as their, you know, their motive to get get forward, get into it. There is a chapter in the book about pass and selection um, that, Just that gives that, you an idea. I mean, how hard is it? I mean, you know, we see Ultimate Hell Week. They're the only ones that we can probably base it. It's as close as we could yeah. understand. Yeah. But I mean, you see people like absolutely screaming at people. You know, they're trying to break people's will. The, the physical, absolutely, but the mental as well. Yeah. And the, the pass rates are. are, are are still quite low. Yeah, um, I think twenty percent pass rate. So I mean, um, it's it's it is very it is very small. But I believe at the end of the day they're getting the best quality of operative, which is you know the point I mean? of it. Which is the whole point yeah. of it. But but I don't. The numbers aren't there either. You know, candidates wise. But something which surprised me. I mean, you go through this absolute hell, okay, um, and you. You become uh, and you and you say if you get twenty percent true, then there's eighty percent not going through. Yeah. And yet there's a high number of returns. Yeah. I think People 40, 40 go back I think to do back. this. Yeah. Why yeah, do you think yeah. that is? Because well, it could be any. Well, obviously the majority is down to injuries. You know, because you can get okay. an injury and you might want to. You know, you will go back. You know what I mean? And that's the great thing about the modular uh, training now. You know that if you do have an injury, you can go back. But I mean, the high the high failure rate is because it is so high octane. I mean, it's endurance training, it's it's physically and mentally uh, hardship, short sleeping periods, constantly on the go. And just to put that into perspective, there's there's a 15 week kind of pre ranger. Yeah, there's loads of preparation I mean, they, courses. They really up their game in, in in pre like they go out and do road shows. They'll explain like when I you know when when I joined the army in, you know 30 years ago. You know, they were still, they were only 10 years, uh, you know, going at the time. Uh, they were still very secretive. But nowadays, they're doing road shows. They're, like, the book is out now. There's loads of information out there now for people. But I mean, to 15 get weeks, then there's a week to say, do you really want to do this? Another yeah, there's week. Like a pre, and then there's 38 yeah, there's a pre -week. weeks yeah. of the actual course. Yeah, yeah. And I mean, as you say, five modules. But I mean, for somebody to take this on, there's also the kind of belief that if you think, 
mentally that you're, you're going to fail this, that you're not going to get through, then you won't. Yeah. I mean, you have to be in yeah, this place. Yeah, you have to this be. Place. Yeah, you have to be, yeah. Okay. Manma August Mishnach, the motto of Kildare County Council, spirit and courage, that we might continue to possess both. Sergeant Wayne Fitzgerald, thank you, and thanks, to, of course, to Paul O'Brien, Mercy Press, the Irish Defence Forces, and the Irish Army Ranger Wing for allowing us a glimpse of what it might be to serve your country as a shadow warrior. Thanks to the Local Studies Genealogy and Archives Department of Kildare Library Services, Riverbank Arts Centre, and of course, Junefest, the National Decadus Centenaries Programme and the Department of Tourism, Culture, Arts, Gale Talk, Sport and Media, and of course, Kildare County Council and the Decade or the, of Commemorations Committee. Thank you, take care, stay safe. And said, no chains shall sully thee, thou soul of love and bravery. Thy songs were meant for the pure and free, they shall never sound in slavery.